Well, good morning. You open your Bibles to Matthew, the 11th chapter, is where we'll begin in just a minute. Matthew chapter 11. It's good to see everyone that's able to be out. It's wonderful to see the Pittmans out with us and baby Caroline. And so certainly need to continue to remember them. We've been blessed, obviously, in this congregation for a number of recent uh, events, babies being born, um, people getting married, all sorts of wonderful things going on. And then obviously, being able to worship God, those that have been baptized, various things, are just so blessed uh, to be able to worship Him today. And last week, you weren't here, but last week when I was preaching at the 11 o'clock service, we talked about adorning, having this adoration or adoring uh, worship for God and what that really means, why we're really here. And there's a lot of things, certainly, that can get into our minds and distract us. There were things that were distracting us before 2020, much less now in 2020, things that come to mind. And the idea of what it truly means to be here, that there's nothing greater than to be able to worship our Lord and our God, and there's no greater thing that we have to remind us of this than his book. The Bible does not just call itself or profess to be some sort of a good book. It doesn't just simply say that these are some good things for you to follow. This book claims to be inspired by God. And from that standpoint, it makes it emphatically clear that everything else will perish but His Word. And the understanding of that and the powerful claim that that is and the understanding that it's not just simply a claim but that it is true. The question is, what's our view of it? If it's that powerful, how often do we read it? How often do we consider it? In Matthew, the 11th chapter, there's such a fascinating conversation that happens here. John Uh, Ask a question of Jesus. Jesus gives a tribute to John the Baptist. He talks about in verse 7 and 8, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? What did you go see? Somebody in some soft clothes? That's in the king's palace, he'll say. But you get down to verse uh, 16. Well, he'll say this phrase or this question, but what shall I compare this generation It is like children sitting in a marketplace who call out to other children saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, behold, a gluttonous man, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. What a fascinating passage this is. What can I say about this generation is a question that I think every generation asks. What can we say about this generation? And we all have answers to that question. Depending on which generation you're a part of, probably. We look at the new generation and it never dawns on my generation or the older generation that it's probably our fault. We have something to do with it. But what would Jesus say? What about this generation? What do I say about this generation? He says, look, you're like children in a marketplace. You played the flute and you were not even willing to dance. We sang a dirge, a song that you would sing at a funeral and you were not willing to weep. And he compares that to John and himself. John came and he was so self-disciplined. He was so strict. He was outside in the wilderness eating only certain things, talking about repentance and the need for repentance. And you said he has a demon. You have a demon, John. Jesus comes along, and he is not solely out in the wilderness. And from a social perspective, he's with everybody else. You call him a glutton. It's never about the words that are being spoken. 
In this situation, it was about the fact that the Pharisees had already made up their mind that John was not who he said he was. Jesus was not who he said he was, and so they looked for reasons for that not to be the case. The Son of God would never eat with those people. A prophet of God would never look like that or be out in the wilderness like John is. And so often today, this is exactly what we can fall into. Instead of listening to the words of God and what His Word says, we get caught up in the, perhaps the one that is saying it. Or we get caught up in our already having our minds made up of what we think truth is instead of listening to what He says. And being willing to continue to grow at what he says. As a preacher, one of the things that's very, very difficult is to always remember it's not about my opinion. It's not about me. But it's about God's word and his truth. I give you sometimes my opinion, but that's all it is. It doesn't matter. It's God's word. And understanding what it says and the power that comes from it. Are we confident in his word? This book is unlike any other book. And I am so afraid that people treat it just like any other book. And it should never be treated that way. This is not a book that we should go home and say, where did I put that book? This isn't a chemistry book. Where did I put that thing? Oh, I haven't seen it since last Sunday. Maybe it's still in my car. This is not that book. This book claims that it can save your soul. And if we believe that to be true, we're going to treat this book vastly different than any other thing we have. In Hebrews, the fourth chapter, when you talk about what the scriptures say of themselves, And this certainly is one of those verses that we go to. He says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It is living, it is active. That's the exact same thing that was going on when the Hebrew writer writes this in chapter 4 as it is today. It's living and it is active. It continues today to do exactly what it did in the first century. Exactly what the Old Testament did. From the standpoint of giving us his words. And us being able to read it. Brian, in his prayer, was talking about that. How blessed we are to have this book. We spend a lot of time reading a lot of nonsense. And a lot of things that don't matter. And we don't spend enough time in this book that's going to get us to eternity with God. There should be no comparison of the two. None. We all have to answer that ourselves, and perhaps for you it's not. Maybe you do read the Bible more. But I have a feeling that that's not the case for everybody. But it is living, it is active, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is something in this book that is, is in 2020, That'll touch your heart. The amazing thing that as we get into 2020 and the things that we're going through from our standpoint that are unpre- unprecedented, we've never gone through them. Humans don't change. And that's why it's awesome to be able to read this book. That was the same. We react, whether it's through technology, whether it's whatever it is, very similar. That's why I'm able to get up here and talk about don't bite and devour one another. Why? Because we still do it, just like they did in the first century. We need to understand what his word does. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, beginning in verse 16, he says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is, the, is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. 
For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, will they accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. And continues. You can certainly continue on here. But I think you get the point. All Scripture is inspired. All Scripture is profitable. All of it is. For various different reasons. The Old Testament still is profitable for us today. But certainly we follow the new. We're under the new. But it's amazing how often we look at these passages. It's sharper. It's living. It helps us get ready and prepared for every good work, as it says in verse 17 of chapter 3. But then you come to chapter 4. Timothy, I want you to preach the truth whether they want to hear it or not, he tells them. You preach it whether they want to hear it or not. Because there will come a time when they're not going to endure sound doctrine. They're going to want to have their ears tickled. And so they'll get people that are just going to teach what they want to hear. They're going to lose their soul. But as he goes on and says, you... Be sober in all things, in verse 5. Enduring hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You do what you have been called to do. It is God's word that we have to put our lives up against to see if we are following it. It is Jesus Christ who is the great ultimate example that we are told to be like, to emulate. I've had people say to me, and I'm sure you have as well, how can this book continue to be what it is 2,000 years later? Because it's God's. Th- <laughs> I've never understood the argument against his, his book. We believe that he created things in six days, which, by the way, to God was a long time. He was able to raise people from the dead. A man lived in a fish. All sorts of things in the scriptures that we can read. He's eternal. And people struggle of whether or not he could keep his book sound. It is truly amazing when it comes down to that view. How Satan has got people to lose confidence in this book that is God's word. Over in 2 Peter, the first chapter, Peter, as he is talking here, and, and certainly we'll see this in a few minutes in 1 cha- in, uh, Peter as well, but he makes it very, very clear. When it comes to his word, now you have to remember, Peter was on the Mount Trans- Transfiguration, and he'll talk about that. Peter saw Jesus, and he talks about the eyewitness account that we have, and certainly the the ability that we have to to read those eyewitness accounts. But in verse 16, he says, For we do not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God and the Father such an utterance as there was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to the lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning stars rises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoken from God. You talk about something we should have confidence in. This book is from God. It's from Him. It's His book. We have the eyewitnesses, certainly, and then we can read about them. Peter saw some amazing things. But even more than that, we have this book penned by by man's hand, but they're God's word. And you can read it. And you can know full well 
to the points that God wants us to know, the amount of things he would like us to know. And you can read it time and time and time again. And it is amazing to me how often I can read the exact same thing time and time and time again and am struck by something totally different than I wasn't before. And it'll happen until the day I die. And that's the idea of us understanding his word. I understand more now about patience and about being confident and focused on him and not getting caught up in distractions this year than ever before. There's verses in this book that mean so much more to me today because of things going on than ever before. And in 2021, it's the exact same thing that's going to happen. If the Lord wills that I'm still here. And it's the opportunity for all of us to understand that you can get caught up in so many different things. I love this quote. Hey, as cultural's, cultural fads ebb and flow, the inescapable truth emerges that century after century, the power of God's written word has surpassed and will continue to surpass the exhilarations of momentary experience, which are conceived and die in an instant. Every single culture comes along. And they come up with these new things. We're talking about from a fashion standpoint, some of you young people were the exact same thing I did. I don't know what's going on. It wasn't good the first time, and it's not good now. But it's amazing how often things come up, and they continue to come up. And you get caught up in the cultural things that are going on. And guess what? The only thing that's going to continue to exist is God's Word. People that sat in the first century thinking that the Roman Empire was going to fall were sad. They, didn't, they would have never have thought that at that time. It is so unbelievably powerful. And here we stand. It's God's word that continues. It's God's word that continues. It's his kingdom that continues. And it's his word that we need to have a relationship with him, the author of what he is saying. Give me the Bible. First Peter, the first chapter, 22 through 25, he tells us it's living and it's the enduring word of God. It's this word. You think about what he says here. Since you have, uh, have in obedience the truth purified your souls for the sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart, for ye have been born again, not of a seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord will endure forever. And this is the word which is preached to you. Living and enduring word of God. Is that how you view it? Because Peter will go on and say, if you view it that way, you should be longing for it, desiring it like a baby desiring milk. Does that describe you? He goes on and talks about the precious value of his word, the precious value of being his child. But you start in verse 7. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom they were also appointed. But you are chosen race, a royal priesthood. We are living stones as he talks about. But it's those that are disobedient to what? To the word. That will have doom. Here's the struggle sometimes. Our idea of being disobedient to the word a lot of times means we go directly against the word, which is absolutely correct. But there's also a lot of other things that fall into that category. Being a child of God, when it comes, ultimately comes down to it, is not a very difficult thing to figure out. If you don't read his word, and if you don't pray to him, I strongly encourage you, strongly encourage you to reconsider whether or not you're obedient to him. 
If you can come to services and not solely focus on Him, I strongly encourage you to reconsider your relationship with Him. You and I have the opportunity to be children of the Almighty God. That is not something that we should ever say flippantly. It is not something that should ever, we should ever take for granted. That shouldn't be something that just falls off our lips and you don't think about it. This word that we have is so precious that we are told not simply just to be hearers of it. I'd like to end by going over to James, the first chapter. In James, the first chapter, beginning in verse 21, he talked about being uh, the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God in verse 20. And then you pick up in verse 21. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and does not, is not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently in the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does." If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his own tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This word in verse 21, it says, it's implanted and it's able to save your soul. It is able to save your soul. If you believe that, why would you not read it? Time and time and time again. How many of us in verse 22 and 23 are described in those verses? You've heard it. Are you doing it? Are you living it? Or are we caught up with this world? In verse 27, a lot of times, including myself, we'll focus on the visiting orphans and widows part, and there's, there's a need for that, and there's a conversation to be had there. But I want you to notice the last part of that. And to be unstained from the world. That is only going to happen if you are abiding in His Word. If you are walking in this life with Him and have that kind of relationship that keeps us from falling into those temptations. That keeps us from those difficulties. Unstained by the world. It doesn't say some stains. Unstained by the world. I pray that all of us understand what this book is. And how powerful it is. And how important it is. In the beginning of the year, I started a reading plan for some that are here, and we read the, some of the Bible every day. My fear sometimes of those things is that we just we get, literally put a check when you're finished reading it, and that's all it becomes, just a check. This book changes hearts. It needs to change ours. It needs to affect us, to have an impact on us, They had the Son of God before them in Matthew, the 11th chapter. And they called him a glutton and a drunkard, the Son of God. And all he was doing is speaking words of eternal life. We have the choice today to make sure that we are right with him, that we are reading his word getting to know the author of this book, that we can be with him for eternity. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time. If you know full well what the scriptures teach and you believe with all your heart that this truly is from God, 
and you're going to follow and do what it says. Why would you wait? To become a child of God, you need to believe with all your heart. Repent of the sins that you have committed. Confess him as the son of God that he is. Be buried with him in baptism for the remission of your sins. Not because I said it, because his Bible says so. His word says it. And if you have questions about that, ask. But if there's anything that we can do for you, I ask you to please come as we stand and sing.